Thank you for having me. I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've been to India uh, a couple of times before, but never to Pune. So I want to thank uh, my friend Sanjay and uh, others that uh, put so much effort in organizing this meeting and uh, seeing some very familiar faces like uh, Dr. Mehta and others. So thank you for, for having me and being here. And these are my disclosures. And I want to share where I uh, work. Uh, this is in, uh, in Florida. This is the University of Florida, and that's our uh, teaching uh, two buildings, and that's a VA hospital where we also have a number of um, uh, 130,000 veterans, and that's our research institute where we uh, work with a group. And if any of you go to Florida, you first do some shopping in Miami, then you visit Mickey Mouse, and then you go to Gainesville to uh, come so I can do a liver biopsy on you. So this is the beach. If that's not enough, I mean, we'll send you to the beach on the weekend as well. So I know that there's a diverse audience, and we're going to keep this very clinical. Uh, number one, let's define what it is. So it's hepatic fat accumulation in the absence of alcohol abuse. So if you drink a lot of whiskey every evening, don't worry. You already have a fatty liver. Um, typically, people are insulin resistant, and uh, they may have diabetes, and it's a big spectrum of the disease that goes from simple fat to inflammation and fibrosis. So uh, the key thing is that the natural history is not very well understood. So I was very excited when National Geographic put liver uh, fat as a complication. And you should know that in the United States, it's the number one cause of liver transplantation between ages 20 and 40. This girl that was on the cover of New York Times is 19 and has cirrhosis from NASH. And it's soon going to be the all cause, uh, number one cause of transplantation. So we have felt that there is a need for a call to action. And I know that in India, this is also a big problem. So we're going to talk a little bit about the disease burden uh, that I'm sure you face in the clinic every day. We're going to talk of how we can diagnose this condition and think about imaging and when to do a liver biopsy. And I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, treatment because there's another session tomorrow. I hope to see all of you at 10.15 tomorrow. Uh, and we're going to talk about weight loss and some medications. And again. Uh, we are going to be covering the, that in more detail tomorrow. So number one, uh, let's see what is our understanding of the disease. Uh, number one, we think that it starts in adipose tissue, whether you're obese or overweight or even lean. If you are insulin resistant, your adipose tissue will be uh, sending um, free fatty acids to the liver and you're going to develop steatosis. Uh, this is also exacerbated by high insulin and high glucose, as you typically have in prediabetes or diabetes. So this creates the perfect storm for uh, tr triglyceride accumulation. Now, from here, we really don't understand what are the mechanisms that lead to inflammation, but we do think that it is a mitochondrial problem. These are normal mitochondria. This is one of our patients with NASH. You see that the mitochondria have this condensation there, they're mega mitochondrias, and there's a lot of work that we're not going to share today, but show that there are a lot of abnormalities. And we don't really understand why people do fibrosis, but we do think that these forces associated with insulin resistance uh, lead to fibrosis as well. So this is the largest series uh, in the United States of people who undergo, um, underwent an MRI and if you, this is, was a study for an, people with type 2 diabetes who just were recruited without knowing if they had a fatty liver or not. And if you take people who have not been exposed to insulin before, three out of four have a fatty liver. So this is a very, very high prevalence. In patients who had been on insulin, it was a little bit lower. <clears throat> but this is a large group of people, 589 patients. So <clears throat> I can imagine that most of your patients also have a fatty liver. And when we want to understand the relationship between liver and adipose tissue insulin resistance, one thing that we do is a test called a euglycemic clamp in which we infuse, say, one unit an hour of insulin, and we see how well 
adipose tissue suppresses. So the more you suppress, the better off. These will be non-obese controls. With that one unit an hour, you suppress lipolysis by about 80%. And then you see that as you get uh, to have diabetes and you have uh, statosis and then NASH is when you have all this big inflammation in the liver uh, that can lead to cirrhosis, you have more insulin resistance. And the opposite of what happens in adipose tissue is what happens in the liver. So as you advance from obese uh, who uh, have fatty liver to NASH with inflammation, you have a lot more insulin resistance. So in other words, insulin resistance in the liver is simply like a mirror of what is happening in your adipose tissue. So this is what we know, that uh, somehow uh, fat that accumulates in the liver, that happens in three out of four patients, about half of them will have inflammation, what we call steatopatitis or NASH, and half of these would have significant fibrosis. So this is a real thing. What you need to do is not to treat fat in the liver, but to try to identify those patients that have fibrosis and are at risk of cirrhosis. So the other aspect that's very important is that they typically have the dyslipidemia, high triglycerides and low HDL. So if you have a patient with elevated liver enzymes, high triglycerides and low HDL, the chances of having a fatty liver are like 90 or more percent, okay? Now, there are many reasons why fatty liver can cause cardiovascular disease, and I know you probably are very well aware of it. Uh, one thing that we have overlooking is that many of our patients have what we call diastolic dysfunction. It's a subclinical state in which you are prone to have uh, fluid accumulation, and this is going to be important in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. So just for what you need to know at a clinical level is that compared to people who don't have a fatty liver, if you have isolated steatosis, what increased significantly is your cardiovascular risk, okay? Now, once you have NASH, the inflammation, you increase your mortality from also liver disease. So many studies have looked at this, and typically patients with NASH have a two or three-fold higher rate of mortality, but the majority are going to die of cardiovascular disease. So you have to be very aggressive in the management. Now, how are we going to diagnose this? This is very important. So we wrote a review uh, trying to make the point that patients with diabetes are at the highest risk of having a fatty liver. So if you only rely on liver enzymes, the alanine aminotransferase, you're not gonna catch very, very many patients. On the other hand, MRI and spectroscopy is a research tool. So things that we do have as endocrinologists or diabetologists is liver ultrasound or something that we call um, control attenuation parameter with a fiber scan, or at least your liver doctors have that. The other thing you can do is use some kind of indexes. So for example, there are several in the literature. This is the most common one called uses age, AST, ALT, and platelets. If you go to your website or, or Google or whatever, you can get the calculator. Uh, and they are pretty good to rule out patients with advanced fibrosis, but there's a lot of patients that you can't really classify because they don't um, really uh, meet the criteria. But think about using the FIP4 index for ruling out people that have cirrhosis. Very good. So we're going to move on, and again, I many times get asked, well, uh, Dr. Cousy, I mean, I've never seen somebody with cirrhosis or in my clinic, so probably you are part of a Nash Mafia, just making a living out of this, but how many times do you have somebody with, in dialysis in your office? So typically, when they get very sick, they go to the nephrologist, they have nephropathy or the liver doctor, but they don't come to us. So, I remember in the 80s, before we started measuring microalbuminuria, we wouldn't find out that people had early nephropathy, or before we used uh, bone densitometers, uh, the only one who had osteoporosis was your grandma. But I think that we are at a stage where we don't have a great test, but soon there's a lot of uh, research going into uh, finding new diagnostic methods. So what can we do? So there is a test called elastography, 
um, which is the, the real name is has this vibration control transient elastography and there's a machine called FiberScan and what it does it measures liver stiffness okay and this was made by the French they wanted to know if their cheeses were ready to go to the market so they sent this beam and looked at how stiff the liver was and somebody said hey let's look at the liver of our patients so um, depending on how back how fast it comes back this liver will be stiffer like when you have cirrhosis or not so it's a very simple device it's a machine that looks like that the newer ones have this and this is something that takes about five minutes in the United States it's not it's a very inexpensive test cost between 20 to 40 dollars um, and I know it might be more expensive here and it gives you these two numbers. The amount of fat above 250, you have a fatty liver, and gives you a number for your fibrosis. Anything above seven or eight, you probably have pretty advanced fibrosis. You, not, you need to do something. If it's like 14, you have cirrhosis. So this is very useful in the clinic. Your liver doctors probably have these devices, and they're being more used otherwise. So this is really, um, to get an idea that about a quarter of the patients with a fatty liver, about 15 to 20 percent, have fairly advanced fibrosis, okay? Very good. And the reason why we focus on fibrosis is because it's associated with mortality. So these are the four fibrosis stages. This is zero, this is cirrhosis, this is mild fibrosis, moderate or pre-cirrhosis. You see that as you begin getting more fibrosis, you're at greater risk of having uh, uh, of dying of liver disease. Now, this is what you can look at uh, when you do an uh, MRI. We do it only for research. This person has portal hypertension. You see it has collateral circulation. And this is a test that you'll see in research studies called magnetic resonance elastography, okay? I'll just give it to you so you know what it is, but we don't use it very much clinically. Now, the final thing is how you, the liver of your patients really looks like. This is a normal liver. This is a liver of somebody who has mild NASH. You see all this fat. This is an hepatocyte that's swollen, uh, means that it has ballooning. And this has inflammation. And if you look at the areas that have more inflammation, um, that means that you probably have fibrosis. So, what I want you to remember, if you have steatosis, that's associated with insulin resistance, with risk of inflammation, and with risk of uh, steatohepatitis. And if you have a NASH, now the risk is cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. So there's not surprisingly a big rise in the rates of cancer from liver disease in patients with diabetes that's driven by NASH. And this is how this patient's liver looks like. All the blue is the fibrosis that's associated with NASH. And this is really what we try to turn around, um, and I'll tell you how to do that. So the biopsy is not something that we're gonna do in every patient. We are going to do it only in those who have advanced fibrosis. And if this is gonna help you, confirm the diagnosis and use some treatment. And I found that many times it's a very highly motivating thing when the patient really finds that they have pre-cirrhosis and they're a middle-aged individual. So this is something to keep in mind. So this is a little algorithm for us. We want to diagnose fibrosis, not just liver fat. So an easy um, group of patients are those with elevated ALT or that have uh, abnormal ultrasounds with fat. What you need to assess is if there's fibrosis. So the most practical thing is to use transient elastography, uh, or if not, these biomarker panels, and based on that, you decide what to do. If they happen to have a lot of fibrosis, you're gonna talk with your liver doctor and try lifestyle or pioglitazone. If it's intermediate risk, you'll discuss this again uh, with the patient and see what's better, low risk. You're just gonna follow them over time, and those are the two tools that you have. Very good. So in the next five to 10 minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about the treatments, but we're gonna talk more about that tomorrow. And I'm gonna run from here to next door to talk about whether pioglitazone is a good drug or not to use. 
and uh, you'll see that it is a good drug, at least to treat NASH. So we'll talk about that. So number one, this is the breakfast of many of our patients in the United States. Actually, I had a patient last week who eats two of these at lunchtime. So you can imagine that it says good on so many levels, but people don't read this. Available now for a limited time only because you're gonna die if you keep eating this. So this is something that is very, very uh, serious. So the other question that I get uh, from primary care doctors, why diagnose NASH if there are no FDA approved treatments? And this is definitely very, very wrong because there are things that you should be doing in your clinic now with your patients. Um, there was a great presentation this morning about ketogenic diets, uh, weight loss by any means um, by famous Dr. Uh, uh, Mehta. So you can know that all of these, uh, anything that makes you lose weight is very, very significant, okay? If you can lose five to 7% weight, fat melts away. But if you lose up to seven to 10%, even the inflammation and fibrosis gets better, okay? So the second reason why you should do something, if you don't believe me, believe the ADA. After many years of harassing them, finally, they decided to put this statement in January. Patient with diabetes or prediabetes and elevated liver enzymes or fatty liver and ultrasound should be evaluated for NASH and for fibrosis, okay? So this is something that we are going to be doing on a routine basis in the same way that we do microbiomes or uh, an eye exam once a year. And hopefully this will catch on. I just wanna show you a simple study done by the, uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Taylor in the UK. What they did, they took a group of patients with type 2 diabetes and put them on a 600 kilocalorie a day diet, which is pretty rough. I have not tried to do this in San Antonio or Florida because I would never recruit anybody. But uh, if you do this, look how liver fat melts away in eight weeks. It's something highly effective. Uh, look at this patient at 36% fat. Normal is to have less than 5% fat. Actually, lean individuals don't have any fat. And you can see that just after four weeks, there's no fat in that liver. So this is something very, very dynamic. And this is what the guidelines of the Liver Society in the United States, and they're similar in Europe, want you to do. Uh, weight loss, at least 7%, and ideally 10% can improve even the scarring in the liver. And exercise helps you lose weight, particularly, and bariatric surgery. So I'm not sure how extensive is bariatric surgery in India, but it is a, a great way to improve your liver. Um, then you have some medication, metformin, great medication for diabetes and hyperglycemia, but does not have a huge impact in NASH. GLP-1 receptor agonists, at the time of these guidelines, there was only one study. There's another study coming next year with semaglutide. And where we have the greatest experience is with pioglitazone in patients with or without type 2 diabetes, and this is something that I'm gonna share very briefly. How does pioglitazone work? You say, well, if you gain a little bit of weight, how can things get better? And what pioglitazone does, it changes your fat to make it the fat of a lean person. So my choice is that people lose 10% of fat, but if they can lose 10% of fat, they take pioglitazone and their fat begins, again, keeping the um, fat and uh, typically not releasing it um, to the circulation. So fatty acids go down and they don't hit the liver and glucose and triglycerides and insulin go down. All those things that made the perfect storm go down. So typically fat goes down by 50 or 60% in patients that take pioglitazone. And again, we were the ones who did this first trial now long ago then there was a, a, another study in non-diabetics that showed benefit. And then we did a three-year study that was published in Annal. So there's very, very strong evidence now that pioglitazone works. Now, we just published a paper that's in press um, now showing that what happens if vitamin E can work, but vitamin E didn't work so well. But when we gave pioglitazone, um, things really got better. So we have four studies showing that pioglitazone works very well. And this is what happened just to the ALT. 
this is the run-in period. We didn't give any indication, just our dietitian saying, cut pizza, bread, and all the bad things. Liver enzymes go down, and then with pyoglitazone, they remain normal. These were the placebo, and then once they get put on pyoglitazone here, they also do pretty well. But the real thing that happens is in the liver. Um, this is the primary endpoint that this is a pretty complicated scale that improved. But look at resolution of NASH. Here the pathologist looks at the biopsy and says there's no more inflammation. And uh, if you look at that, about two-thirds of the patient improved. And then we also looked at those who had the worst NASH. And again, 67% of patients did better. So you have a medication that's fairly inexpensive that can improve the liver of two out of your three patients. And again, uh, there are other benefits of pioglitazone, which I'm going to be talking about in a little bit. You not only improve the liver, but you improve the lipids because you lower triglycerides, you increase HDL, you improve insulin resistance, you reduce cardiovascular disease, and you also prevent diabetes. It's the most effective drug to prevent diabetes with a 70% reduction in the progression to type 2 diabetes. Now, there are other things that you need to monitor, okay? So there's weight gain, uh, but again, it's a healthy weight gain. I don't like any weight gain, don't get me wrong, but I would like our patients to understand that if there is some weight gain, it's going to be uh, associated with a reduction in cardiovascular disease. It's the only time when you gain weight and you have about a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease. Some patients are going to get edema. So you, I would avoid it if your BMI is very high, about 40, if you're high doses of insulin, or if you're an amlodipine that also causes edema. There is some bone loss. And the issue of bladder cancer has kind of gone away. Uh, you might have heard some studies. There are now 23 studies. 18 are negative, and those that are positive, you would have to give pyoglitazone for three years, depending on the study, to 877 to 4,500 patients to have one case of bladder cancer. So anyway, I always do a urinalysis, make sure there's not hematuria. And the other thing that is being very confusing is whether it causes heart failure, and I'll explain that in my other talk. But we've known for a long time that pyoglitazone improves the heart. And there's been a recent study by the group of Dr. DeFranco who showed that patients with type 2 diabetes that don't have diastolic dysfunction have an improvement in their cardiac function. So in reality, what happens if you have undiagnosed heart failure and you have edema that happens in 1 out of 20 patients, you're going to have an increase in, in heart disease. So, in practical terms, because I want you tomorrow to begin diagnosing your patient with NASH and treating them with lifestyle and with uh, pyoglitazone. First, you get the labs, you get a urinalysis to make sure there's no hematuria. You're gonna do a liver ultrasound if you have a fiber scan or you send it to your liver doctor. Um, you're gonna maybe, if it's a postmenopausal women, check for osteoporosis, make sure they don't have heart failure. Uh, that is very, very important. I think patients that are very obese tend to have edema. So this is a bad, bad choice. And people who take amlodipine, particularly 10 milligrams, tend to have uh, edema. So that's not a great combination. I typically start 15 milligrams or 30. And then what I do in the next visit, if there is good tolerance, I might increase it from 15 to 30. In the studies, we use 45. But in the clinic, I only use 30. In the studies, you wanted to see the maximum effect. But in the clinic with 30 milligrams, you get probably 90 or 95% of the benefit, OK? And then you look for uh, ankle swelling, any shortness of breath, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm going to just finish in the last three minutes with um, some information on other agents that you may be using. This is uh, something that's coming out in press. I reviewed all the studies with lidaglutide. So typically, weight goes down, ALT improves, and liver fat goes down. So this is a good approach. But it's not only to, for lidaglutide. We see it, for example, with dulaglutide, liver enzymes going down, probably fatty liver getting better. It's just a function of weight loss. What other agent can we do to help for weight loss? Well, we did a study with canagliflozin, uh, which there was like a 40% reduction in fat 
but also some in the placebo. So it's really a function of weight loss. You lose weight and liver fat, this is intrahepatic triglycerides, goes down. Okay, still there's a patient on placebo who lost a lot of weight. So it's really a function of weight loss, and there are similar studies with dapagliflozin and with empagliflozin. So this is the future spectrum. If you think you have a lot of diabetes medications, there are as many drugs for NASH, which I'm not going to torture you with, but people are trying to find pyoglitazone-like molecules that don't have the weight gain. There's a number of other agents that work with FXRs. There's a number of other agents working at different steps of the cascade. So just to give you some background of where the field is going. So what I really want you to remember is we start with fat, but not because we want to treat fat in the liver. What we want to treat is fibrosis, okay? And weight loss of 7 to 10% induces regression of fibrosis, same as weight loss of, with any medication or pyoglitazone. They all help the inflammation and the fibrosis. So your next step is to see if they have fibrosis, and if they have fibrosis, then you do lifestyle and pyoglitazone treatment. And again, that's your more practical approach, the imaging. If not, remember Googling or putting in your uh, web browser FIB4 or the NAFLD fibrosis score, okay? So with that, I'm gonna just finish. I know you have many choices now in your diabetes scenario. Um, TCDs have been relegated to those if you don't wanna cause hypoglycemia or as the medication of the poor um, in terms of uh, with sulfonylureas, but I think where we're going to go in the future guidelines will be, I'm sorry, will be to incorporate TCDs as the drug for NASH. So my last slide is here to remember, NAFLD is causing a lot of harm in our patients with diabetes. Your liver is just a mirror of your insulin resistance and your dysfunctional fat. High risk population for, for fibrosis are obese, diabetic, and those with high liver enzymes. Um, cardiovascular disease is gonna be the number one cause of mortality. You can give statins to these patients. Give your patients statins because it's safe and it does not typically increase liver enzymes. Diagnosis, fibrosis is really what you wanna find and it's a predictor of mortality. Liver biopsy for those in whom this will motivate the patient and whom you wanna be sure of the diagnosis. And again, focus on people that have fibrosis. Liver guidelines provide lifestyle, and if you have NASH documented, you use pyoglitazone. And I think for you to remember, pyoglitazone will be to NASH what metformin has become for um, the management of type 2 diabetes, a very cheap but effective approach. And the ADA has also incorporated NASH as a complication to treat and in the ADA guidelines, pyoglitazone is also cited as, as a beneficial thing. So with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you for this invitation. This is the team of people that make it possible. Please come visit me.